us and let's worship together. do our call to worship, uh, call to prayer. So if you would, please bow your head and pray with me. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to just to be here, God, just to come and worship you. I thank you so much that you tore the veil, God. We don't need a middleman. We can come directly to you, God. I'm so happy that you're not a distant and angry God, but you love us. You know the very hairs on our head, Lord God. You know the family that we're going to be born in, God. You know that we were going to be here at this moment, God. And I just thank you for that. Thank you, God. I pray that we go forth in peace for this entire week, God, and this entire service. I pray that you feed our souls, Lord, with our daily bread. In the name of Jesus, amen. The scripture is going to come from Psalms 33, 1 through 3, and Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. It reads, Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre. Lyre? Make, a music, make music for him on the ten string harp. Sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to act of love and good works 
and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. This next one is Great I Am.
The mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or anyone can stand before the power in the presence of the great I am, 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 the great I am. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, the great I am. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee. shake before you the demons run and flee at the mission of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or anyone can stand before the power in the presence of the great i am the great i am the great i am Father God, we just continue to come into your presence this morning. Lord, we never take for granted the opportunity we have to do this together as the family. Lord, and something about coming into your church, coming in these walls, leaving all of the important and busy and distracting things that vie for our attention, and coming into this place, Lord, and just laying them down at your feet so that we can be in your presence so that we can lift up to you the praise and the honor and the glory that you and you alone deserve. Lord, we are grateful for that opportunity today. And so we lift our voices to you. Lord, we lift our hearts to you. We clear our minds for you. Lord, all of the distractions we lay at your feet and we invite your Holy Spirit to come freely in this place, to move within our ears and into our hearts. Lord, to speak to us to nudge us as you will. As we attempt to honor and praise you, Lord, we are open to your Holy Spirit's movement. Father God, we invite you now to move in ourselves and in our families, whether they're here with us or they are back home. Lord God, we pray for our loved ones. We ask that you would hold them tight right at this very moment. Lord, that they would know of your presence, they would know of their value, they would know of our care and our concern for them. Lord God, I pray for a special blessing of communication for every single person in this room and hearing this, Lord, that there would just be the ability as we talk to those that we love and, and uh, interact with them, Lord, that uh, they would hear the important words and they would know their value in our eyes. Lord God, where there are decisions being made, would you bring wisdom and would you bring patience would you bring the ability to hear and see your will in front of us? Would you give us the discipline to fall in behind what it is that you are doing? Lord God, where there is conflict, would you bring peace? Would you bring the ability to give forgiveness and seek forgiveness, to offer forgiveness, Lord God, and to ask for forgiveness? 
Father, we praise you for being in the midst of all of our relationships and all of our decisions. Lord God, and then where our physical well-being is concerned. Lord, there are times where it is so frustrating and we wring our hands and we want so badly to do something for one another that we simply can't do. And so in this moment, Lord, where there needs to be healing, we ask for your mighty hand of healing, that you would move in those that we are thinking about, you would move in ourselves. Lord, you would bring a wholeness into our physical bodies. We acknowledge you are the great healer and we call on you right at this moment, Lord, to do the miraculous work that you and you alone can do. Father, we praise you, we give you honor, we celebrate who you are together. We lift one another up as the body of Christ as we continue to worship you and your great name. Amen. You call me out upon the waters great unknown where feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand and I will call upon We celebrate that truth. We hold on to that truth, Lord, that we are yours and you are mine. It is our grounding. It is our wholeness. It is our center in this world. Lord, we thank you for it. 
We invite you now as we open your word to continue to speak into our hearts. Lord, continue to fill us with your truth, with your love, with your wisdom, and our sense of your presence and leadership in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we all pray together. Amen. Awesome. Well, you may certainly have a seat. However, if you are a four-year-old through fourth grade, at this point you are dismissed to join your teachers in the back of the room and head on out. Um, going to mention it again a little later. I, I just, I, I, you know, I hope it never falls on deaf ears how much we appreciate. And certainly as she's walking out, that's Ashley Geiger right there in the black dress. Ashley is our children's ministry director, which means her key job is like whack-a-mole. It's just constantly with the fact that we have people coming and going nonstop. She can just never take her foot off the gas pedal. And I know sometimes it probably feels like it falls on deaf ears when we were just saying, hey, we need more teachers, we need more teachers. It's not because we have people who aren't stepping up and doing what they're doing. It's just because of the constant outflow of people in order to have a regular weekly children's ministry. If that's an all in interest, uh, if you grabbed a connection card when you came in, you can indicate on that and then drop it in the offering plate. You can grab Ashley after service, you can grab myself after service, and we'll get you plugged in and we'll make sure you have all the information you need to uh, assist and be a part of what is going on in our children's ministry. So we always appreciate that and uh, certainly thank them for all the work that they do. Well, um, you know, we have uh, been in the book of Romans for quite some time. We've taken a couple detours in the last weeks as we've had some guest speakers. Last week we talked about Vacation Bible School. But as a part of this, we've been in Romans 12 for a bit and we're still in Romans 12 because there's a lot more that Paul has to say to us through that. But I'll tell you before I start, um, most mornings I start by reading, um, opening up like maybe my CNN app on my phone and reading some of the news. And then after I do that, I will switch over and I will read, I'll open up my Fox News app and read a bit there. Or if I wanna mix it up, maybe I'll start with the Fox News app and then I'll go with the CNN app. And the reason I do both well, it factually is because I don't trust really the perspective of either. I know that any more today, any, pretty much any, and I know there's some more central ones, but, but most any news outlets are going to have a perspective. And so I always choose, you know, I want to read one on one side and one on the other, figure that the truth probably falls somewhere right down in the middle, and uh, it's just a reality. Now, I think at some point in our human history, I think that both of those agents that I mentioned attempted to be impartial. I, I believe that, that, that those days, however, are long gone. You know, uh, I know that when I read CNN, I'm going to get a little more of a left-leaning perspective. When I read Fox, I'm going to get a little bit more of a right-leaning perspective. And, uh, you know, and, and it's just a reality of, of what it is. And, and like I said, I know that there's some that are right in the middle. And I don't mean to get your blood pressure up because I know this is one of those topics that starts to everyone just starts to pulse and race and we all have opinions on that. But it's an important thing to talk about because call me naive, but I truly believe that neither side when we're talking about something like that is attempting to mislead anybody. I believe that what folks are doing is that, that really uh, they are pushing their perspective because they believe their perspective is the honest, uh, more correct, more right perspective, and they're doing that. I, I'm just going to stay in my naivety and, and believe that that's the case, okay? But it is a, a perspective. And I know that it is super low-hanging fruit to pick on the way that the news outlets come at us, the way that we deal with political issues with social media, because, you know, we always pick on ourselves for that, but it's just a reality that, that it's the place that where it is the most evident in our culture that we as a culture have lost our ability to engage with one another and have perspective differences in a healthy and civil manner, all right? That's just a reality. Anybody who has access to any social media knows that even some of the most well-intentioned, well-rounded friends of ours that maybe lean on one side or the other, that boy, we've seen them get into it and it is ugly and it goes at it and it makes our, our pulse race and, and it's frustrating at times. And it's just a reality of these things that the day of honest, intellectually honest debates 
I think are, are mostly over. We now live in a society where hate-filled tweets and posts and accusations are, are, are the call of the day, where otherwise good people have decided that they know exactly what someone meant when they posted something. They know exactly what their perspective, they know why they said that, you know, and we, we come at it in such a charged way and again, I know I'm not you know, saying anything that we don't see every day. It's why some of us have had to learn to like, I can't start my day by opening social media because instantly I'll find myself charged and in a bad mood because somebody said this or somebody said this and they're into this and it's all these things. But I say all that to say that more than ever, there is a call for Christ following people to be the bringers of peace in the midst of so much hate and anger and frustration and division in this world. Need to say that again, that, that the call for anybody that has chosen to follow Christ, I'm not saying you can't have an opinion. I'm not saying you can't have a perspective. And I'm not saying we're not allowed to feel one way or the other or care or even be involved in politics. But if you are a follower of Christ, you and I have the responsibility to be the one who is bringing peace into the conversation, into the, the setting, as opposed to the one who is bringing fuel to the fire. Now, I'm not saying that it is wrong to be angry. There is a very real thing called righteous indignation in the face of injustice. We saw Jesus model it at certain points, and there is a place for it. But many, 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 many times, we are stepping way beyond that and we're just dealing more with opinion things. And the fact is, is that we should not, we should not as followers of Christ be propagators of fear and of hate and of frustration and of all the things that we tend to get sucked into when it comes to social media. We shouldn't be the ones getting sucked into that stuff. So if you are a person who bravely wades into the debates of the day, and, I, and that does take a certain amount of bravery to do that, and if you find yourself constantly drawn into the ugly confrontations, even though it was never your intention, maybe you just posted something that seemed like just good common sense, and the next thing you know is you and your you know, sister-in-law or your cousin, you guys are going at it, and it's ugly, and it turned, you know, if that is happening more and more, what I would say this morning is that maybe it is time to evaluate where you are with the Lord, not the other person. And, and, and I know that I'll ha hijack anything to say, hey, we need to evaluate where we are with the Lord. But this is one of those really important times when we find ourselves getting into certain situations where it is very important to evaluate, where am I with the Lord? Because I do firm believe, and I believe that Scripture firmly teaches that our, our horizontal perspective is greatly affected by our, our vertical relationships. Or another way to say that, and I think it's up here, is that our worldly perspective is a direct reflection of our heavenly relationship. Our worldly perspective is, is a direct reflection of the, the interaction we have with heaven. And even another simpler way of saying that is that the way that we view and interact with our society today is directly impacted by the relationship that you and I have with Christ. I, I don't know how to make that much more clear for myself, but that the, the way that I interact with other people is always gonna be impacted by where my relationship is at with the Lord. Now, as I said, we have been in Romans 12. I mean, I know we had a couple weeks break, but it's been a few weeks that we've been settling in Romans 12. When we're back there again this morning, and we're going to pick up in verse 9, and the timing is really important for where we are as a society right now. Because I think Paul is writing these words in Romans 12. Well, I know for a fact that Paul is writing to a culture, to a group of people who are trying to live out Christian lives in a very progressive society that wants nothing to do with their Christianity. And he's trying desperately to help them figure out how to navigate this walking with Christ in the midst of a world that might not see it from the same perspective that they do. And of course, that is exactly what you and I, if we have chose to be Christ followers, are attempting to do ourselves. 
And so it is very much worth a look. And he is telling them, and he is telling you and I today that there are some things that we need to practice if we are going to do this well, if we're going to navigate this, who we are as people of the Bible and how we're living in this world with some sort of uh, uh, relationships and connection to community and not just pulling ourselves completely out of the picture. And so in order to be what society needs, we as the follower of, of Christ need to implement some things. And these are what Paul starts to launch into in Romans chapter 12. And the first thing that he points out, the very first thing that he drives home to us is that if we're going to have an impact, if we're going to be able to bring unity in a divided world, the first step is that we must love sincerely. He makes no qualms about it. You and I have to be serious about the love that we have for this world. And it starts in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, when he says very, very clearly, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. Obviously, love is a big deal to Paul. Remember, this is Paul the persecutor. Paul who, who the way that he showed his love to God previous to encountering Christ was by just destroying anybody that wasn't living by the rules. And now that he's in this new perspective where he has been forgiven and he knows all of his own guilt and he is wrestling and grappling with this fact that God loves him even though he did all these terrible things and he is figuring out love and he is just always speaking it and talking it and pushing how important it is for you and I to be people of love. You know, uh, um, I've been uh, working with a couple recently back home, uh, getting ready to be married, and, and we, of course, it's very hard to do any premarital counseling and not find yourself in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is the love chapter. And, and we talk about it in couples, we talk about marriages, but this is some of Paul's finest words on, on the importance of love. And remember, as we've just been talking about in previous weeks, all these wonderful things, the spiritual gifts, the, the power that the Holy Spirit has given us to live for, you know, and, and, and to do things with the Spirit's power and all of this. But in Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, he makes that point and he says, hey, look, if I have the gift of prophecy and I could do all these incredible things, but I have not love. I got nothing. If I have the gift of so-and-so, but I have not love, I'm just a clanging symbol, just making noise in this world. If I have the gift of whatever, but I have not love, I'm useless in the grand scheme of things. And he goes on to say, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. And it's almost as if he is talking to, you know, us on, whether it's on social media, the way we interact with each other in society today, he is coming at us in that. And he's saying as people of love, we can't be those things. And, and you know, where there is real love, the following things are happening. We love each other without hypocrisy. We read, uh, obviously, 12, 9, and 10, and, and it says, you know, hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. And, and that, I love the translation, the New Living Translation, hate what is wrong, but it really misses the most literal translation. The most literal translation of that word is hate what is evil. Not just saying, because, it, it, and that's very important, because when we say, hey, hate what is wrong, wrong, you know, that's kind of an opinion thing. Whatever you think is wrong, hate that. It's not really what it's going at. Evil is not an opinion thing. Evil is opposite of this. And he's saying, hate evil, love people. And, and he drives that, drives that, drives it. Cling to what is good, love with genuine affection. All of these things. I, I, I'll be honest with you. Man, I started, I pastored my first church at the age of 23. And I was a leadership hound. 
You know, I knew I had so much to learn. So I was reading every leadership book. I was following all the, everything. You know, we didn't have podcasts at that day, but I'd go to conferences, I, all the things I could. And I picked up that one of the great ways to be a great leader is you go find great leaders and you ask them questions. And so I was that guy where I was calling like mega churches in Southern California and just, you know, offering pastors, I'll buy you lunch, I'll buy you a cup of coffee if I could just sit down and ask you a list of questions. And, and I got with some of them and I asked them the questions and I was trying so hard to be. And, and I just thought if I could glean from these mega church pastors, I could become a mega church pastor. I could do all this. And at some point over the years, suddenly that need to be this big church pastor, just, it, it just became less and less important. And the thing that I found myself most moved by was pastors, men and women who had been pastoring churches for many years and yet somehow miraculously still loved people. Like that's where I started to realize because I saw pastor after pastor after pastor leaving the ministry and, and Christian after Christian after Christian leaving the church because, you know, they were frustrated and hurt and all these things. Yet I saw these people, whether they were pastors or even just people in church that had been a part of it for so long, but they still genuinely loved. And I found myself, those were the people I started calling and asking, can we have a cup of coffee? Can I take you to lunch? And my question was always the same. How? How do you just, after all these years, how do you still love people so much? And, and, and that became just a great movement. That's the kind of drive and conversation that Paul is pushing at. To love others without hypocrisy and to have genuine affection. It, it, it means that we have to hate the evil things and we have to love the good things and we have to love people. And this preaches on so many levels, and it's a great guide to how we should interact with society. But it's also a great guide to my own personal walk. If I love people without hypocrisy, it means I don't act like I care just in order to get something from somebody. It means I try to see them desperately with the eyes of Jesus. I mean, I, I love a good perspective challenging movie as much as the next person, you know, uh, and I love it sometimes where there's a story, a book or a movie that where, you know, a, a character that's been throughout history and literature as an evil type person and suddenly, you know, there's a different perspective and whether it's, you know, the the minions or despicable me or whatever, you know, we, we see like, oh, maybe there's another side of the story. But the fact is, evil's evil. And sometimes we try to want to make it a little too cute. <laughs> but evil's evil. And that's what we're called to stay away from. Anything in this life that is not of the Lord. Remember, there is a real enemy whose plan is to steal and to kill and destroy. And Paul is saying with desperation in his voice, look, you and I, if we are saying we are followers of Christ, our job is to stay away from that. Abhor the evil things but cling to what is good and love people with a sincere heart. But the fact is, is this doesn't just happen. So Paul turns his attention away from really uh, the way they interact with the world back to our relationship with the Lord saying, for us to do this, there are some things we got to do. And the second thing he points out after saying love sincerely is that we have to work hard. Just simply, we got to work hard. Verse 11 goes on to say, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Now, I have always fallen into the trap whenever I feel insecure about something, the one thing I know I can do, I can just work harder. He's not just saying, sweat it out. He's not just saying, go put in a you know, 12 hour day and only get paid for eight. He's talking about working at our relationship with the Lord. He's talking about don't be lazy about who we are with the Lord. Don't be lazy about God's word. He's saying work hard at this stuff. Press into it in the morning. Be challenged by it. Spend some time at the end of the day being honest with the Holy Spirit and saying, how did I do today? How did I, you know, how did I do with the commitments, the things that I read this morning and, you know, and having to be honest about maybe, maybe tomorrow's a new day and maybe that's a good thing today but the willingness to work at it. You know, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 15, when, when uh, the different churches are kind of being called out, the church in Laodicea, their biggest thing that they got called out for is the fact that they got lazy. 
They stopped working at their relationship with the Lord and it showed up in the way that they began to treat one another and they treated the outside world. And the challenge was we can never get lazy on this. Uh, uh, you know, and it's, uh, it's the very same conversation we have with marriages. We say, you can love someone so deeply, and we know when we stand at the altar and we have those incredible exchange of vows, it can never just end there. That marriage relationship, that loving relationship, it takes work for the rest of our lives to keep putting that relationship in front of ourselves and our own selfish desires. Of all the great marriage books that are out there, one of the ones that I love the most by the Egrich uh, husband and wife is, is called Love and Respect, and it, and it has this great little section in it where it says, conflict is the price for greater intimacy. But basically what it's saying is, it's hard work. Greater intimacy in your marriage, it means you're gonna work through the stuff. Same thing with Christ. When we get lazy and we just stop you know, being honest and challenging and saying, I don't want to do this, and, but why should I do this? Why should I follow the, why, Lord, are you asking me to do And we get honest about, that's the hard work. And he's saying that hard work will pay great dividends if we truly want to be the kind of people that bring unity and not division in this world. So we love sincerely. We work hard. And then Paul goes on to say, and then we've got to just persevere. Verse 12, rejoice in our confident hope be patient in trouble, and man, keep on praying. It's basically that. We've, I know we've said it, it's like a broken record. Us being followers of Christ, that does not get us out of the crisis and the hurt and the heartache and the things that come. But we have some promises in the midst of that. But his point is, in the midst of that, we've got to persevere. He's saying, look, stuff is still going to happen. It's still going to be tough. There are still going to be tough times ahead. What is happening in the world is not changing. It's just going to continue to be. But what should be changing is the way that we respond to the things of the world. Rejoice in the hope that we have of who we are in Christ. That matter is settled because of what Christ did on the cross. Be patient in the midst of trouble or crisis. And he says, by all means, keep on praying. Don't stop. Keep pressing into the Lord. Under any circumstance, don't stop going to the Lord. And I've said it before, I, I, one of the, the times I got in the most trouble in all of my ministry years when I was doing youth ministry uh, many, many years ago in Arizona, and I, I was responsible for these little breakout sessions at a youth camp, and I taught a... a a class called What Sucks About Christianity because I just wanted to have the honest conversation about there's some stuff that is just, you know, if you're looking from the outside, it's just not great. And, and one of the things I talked about was the fact that, that we're not allowed to be honest about when, when we just don't like it. We just don't like that we're being told we can't do this or the Bible saying I can't do what I want to do. And in that, one of the conversations I had was what I love the most. It's why I love the Psalms. If you ever read the Psalms from that perspective, we get the picture that David and some of the other Psalmists, I mean, we, we read them sometimes kind of so stoically, but some of those Psalms, David was up on the hillside and he was just having it out with God. Like, I do not like this situation. Why are you not here? You said you would be here, but I do not see you. Why am I in this situation? I did what you told me and yet I'm not. Yet, what I missed probably when I first talked about it was, you know, it was always done in a certain level of respect. But I love that honest, just have it out in the midst of the crisis. And that's what persevering does. We hold on to these things. We hold on to these truths. We hold on to these hopes. And then we just persevere. We rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. And above all else, keep on praying, persevere. The next thing that Paul throws in here, and it almost feels like a little sidebar, says to practice hospitality. Be people of hospitality. Verse 13 through 15 says, When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. So be ready to help those in need. Practice hospitality with eagerness in our hearts. 
Bless those who persecute you. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who, who are happy. And, and the reality is, is we need to understand that having our friends over, biblically speaking, is not really hospitality. That's just having our friends over. Because sometimes I fall into that trap. Oh, I have friends over all the time. That's not being necessarily hospitable. That's just what I enjoy. That's the easiest. But the idea that the word for hospitality used in the Greek New Testament is, is, is philozenos. And it's this idea of literally having love for strangers. And there is this implication that it is inconvenient. And it's really a way of saying, be willing to be inconvenienced by the people that maybe aren't our circle of friends. That's what hospitality is. That's the challenge that we're given if we're going to continue to be these type of people that he wants us to be these, uh, in this world, is ones who are willing to get involved and be inconvenienced. Persecution in, in some form or another was so common, certainly in this first century, for those trying to live for Christ in Rome, that there was always someone that was in need because of what they were going through. And he's saying, whether you know them or not, be willing to be inconvenienced by others and be there for others. Be someone that doesn't just think about our own circumstance and our own comfort, but willing to think more about how others' perspective and others' comfort is. Uh, um, I think I was the most challenged by this. A handful of years ago, my brother, my brother-in-law and I went to, we flew to Alaska for a fishing trip. And I knew it was going to be a long flight, and I was a little uptight about, I mean, I'm not a small guy, so I get nervous about how scrunched am I going to be in that airplane seat. And when I got on the plane and realized that it was a fairly empty flight, and as I walked row after row, I realized it was pretty much two to every three-seat row. It was fantastic. And so I sat by the window, my brother-in-law sat in the, in the aisle, my, my brother sat on the other side, and we were going to have this space in between us, and I could see all the way down, no one was having to have a third person in the middle. And then right at the end, a couple extra people came on. So I realized a few people. And I watched, you know, I was doing what you responsibly do in that setting. You look busy, you look big. You know, you, you do that so, so, because this wouldn't be the great place to see. And, I, and I'm thinking, but out of the corner of my eye, I can see my brother-in-law who is one of my mentors at loving people. And I can see that his eyes are up and he's trying to make eye contact with someone coming down the aisle. Like, like he is just oozing, you're welcome to sit here. And in my mind, I'm like, shut up, Johnny. Like, don't do, and sure enough, you know, this person's looking and everybody on the plane's doing what we do, you know, big, psh, no room here. And then finally, someone makes eye contact and he's got this eager, and yes, the person sat with us. And, and at first, I was so like, Duh! And then the Lord just slapped me in the face and I was convicted and I felt like a jerk because I was not willing to be inconvenienced in that moment. But to be who we need to be for Christ. And that's such an important piece of the puzzle. And then this incredibly uh, important piece, this final thing that he lays out, be people of peace. As far as it is concerned with you and I, be people of peace. Look at verse 16 through 21. If I could read this and then we'll wrap it up. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Live at harmony with each other. Don't be proud. Don't think that we know it all. Don't pay back evil for evil. Be honorable. Do what we can to live at peace with one another. Never take revenge. Feed our enemies. Conquer evil by doing all we can. I, that, that phrase, do all you can to live at peace, means there may be times in this world where you know, peace just isn't, isn't to be had. And obviously, we're all a part of something where that's just the case. That's a reality at times. But as far as it is up to me, 
don't let that be my fault. Don't let my pride or my lack of humility or whatever be the issue in there. I don't know if you remember the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, but in Guardians of the Galaxies 2, okay, there's, I mean, the Guardians of the Galaxies, they're all these super studs. Some of them have superpowers. Some of them just have, like, really cool weapons and stuff. But anyway, they're the Guardians of the Galaxy, and they've got all this stuff. And in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, they meet this one character, and this one character uh, has basically whose superpower it is, that the Mantis, the superpower is to help people feel calm. And it's kind of mocked at first, like of all these great superpowers, like the superpower is to make people feel calm. And it's just seen as this super lame, super not impressive superpower. But the fact is, biblically speaking, man, that's a key superpower. Like you and I have that ability to have that superpower, to be the bringers of peace, to be the one because of our connection with the Lord, not because we're that great or we have eloquent words or we are that talented or gifted or whatever, but because we are so connected with who Jesus is in our life that when we enter a situation and there is just peace, there is calm, that's an incredible and an important superpower in this world that is fracturing on all fronts. And you and I, because of Christ, have the ability to be the bringers of peace. Let that be our superpower in this world, that we would bring peace with us wherever we go. Love sincerely, work hard with our relationship with the Lord, persevere in times of trouble, be people of hospitality, meaning be willing to be inconvenienced, and be the bringers of peace in a world seemingly void of peace. Father, Lord, I I, uh, thank you so much for your words. I thank you for Paul's challenge. I thank you for uh, the understanding that that these people he was writing this letter to are in so much similar situations to ours. And so, Father, our hearts and our ears are open this morning. Lord, we want to be bringers of peace in this world. We want to be part of the the cause of, of bringing unity in a very divided time. Lord, help us be challenged. Lord, I know for myself, I'm sure every one of us has a certain area here that we we wrestle with. And so we open ourselves to your spirit right now. We want to grow. We want to be more connected with you so that we can ooze more out of you, uh, out of us, of you in this world. Lord God, that is our desire. That is our hope. And we accept the challenge. In the name of Jesus, we pray together. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, in just a moment, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward and we will close our service with uh, just a few announcements. Uh, If you haven't been here before, just want to make sure you understand this offering that we take. We call it our religious offering fund. Uh, It it is for some people, it might be a tithe, but we understand that a lot of us give a tithe back to a home church and we absolutely support and love that. We believe that's biblical, Uh, but we have an opportunity as, as being a part of a base chapel we don't have to, you know, the, the, we don't have to collect funds to turn the lights on and pay the bills and all those things. So all this money that we collect, we give out into other things. We do some stuff with some of our youth ministry. We're able to do a ton of stuff like Vacation Bible School, help out some of the community programs around Guantanamo Bay. That's where all of this goes. And so um, uh, we're just grateful for the hearts of giving. And we believe that as God kind of tugs on our heart, to give above and beyond whatever might be our tithe or whatever that is, that that's what we do. But it is never out of a sense of obligation. It's not paying dues. It's not tipping on how good the service was that day or anything like that. This is just a very personal time between us and the Lord and a time of giving. So I'm going to pray to receive our offering as the ushers come forward. Father, Lord, we do thank you for this time to give back to you. Lord, and we know that that even on this base, uh, there are just plenty of needs, and we're always asking you for to lead us and guide us in the best way to give towards those. Lord, we thank you for the glad hearts of giving this morning, for the generosity that is modeled by so many uh, with time and uh, use of their gifts and talents, and then certainly with finances. Would you receive this offering with the hearts that it's intended? Would you use it for your glory? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, all right. Thank you, guys. As they collect that uh, this morning, just a a couple things to point out. Remind you that our 9 a.m. Bible study uh, happens every Sunday morning, Book of Acts. 
Uh, right now, they're continuing to roll through that. It is over in room 16. Happens from 9 to 10 in the morning. You are invited to that. Uh, I want to point out again, as we mentioned, as the kids were being dismissed, that as we head back into the fall, in order to be able to get back to a place where we have children's ministry every Sunday, right now we're on a every other Sunday. Uh, they're, today they're out. Next Sunday they'll be with us. We'll be doing that for a while until all of our folks come back on island or we have new folks step up and uh, we're able to get, uh, get that. But if you are at all interested in helping out with our children's ministry, that uh, uh, there is a small fingerprint process that happens. All you have to do, it's not a fingerprint process at all. Sorry, it's a background check. All you have to do is fill out a form. We take it down to VRO. We get the background check and you're good to go. But if you are at all interested in that, uh, we want to make sure you are aware of that. Uh, if you have uh, teens or preteens, I want to let you know, be listening for information. In the next few weeks, our youth ministry, Wednesday night youth ministry, will be relaunching. And uh, we're looking forward to that. So we'll be getting information to you on all of that. But uh, uh, with that, again, we just always appreciate those that are stepping up in so many different ways. Well, I would love to close this morning uh, by reading out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, which you may recognize as something we call the Lord's Prayer. So would you stand with me? And we will close together by reading this together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful Sunday.